via leftists and liberals do much of the canceling against others, right? That's kind of yeah. I would say, look, uh, censorship goes on all the time. Mm -hmm. That's the way our is that going to be a problem? That's fine. Okay, censorship goes on all the time. Uh, it takes various forms. Yeah, I think the problem now, in my view, is that the left, uh, or what's called the left, mm -hmm. has adopted, appropriated uh, the tactics of uh, of of uh, of I don't know, I won't call it intellectual repression, of speech repression, which the left has for a long time the champion. The champion the right of free speech because otherwise most people on the left would end up in jail or they end up deported. Mm -hmm. So they were the chief proponents of free speech. Yeah. And now they've become a chief proponent of censorship. Yes. So for example, all the attempts now being made to censor the social media. Mm -hmm. uh, and liberals and leftists have been in the forefront of the attempts to censor the social media. Have there been attempts to pass legislation? Because you said the government so yeah, far has so, done a good job. Yeah, there have been attempts. You know, there have been a lot of attempts to yeah. pass legislation uh, curbing criticism of Israel. Mm -hmm. you know, that's been a, a very popular, yeah, of uh, uh, very popular among uh, some groups of people to declare BDS anti-Semitic mm -hmm. and to try to limit the speech. But there's all, all sorts of uh, other um, battles being fought between, on the one hand, those who still regard the freedom of, uh, freedom of speech of the First Amendment mm -hmm. as a foundation stone of not so much our society, but a foundation stone of trying to find truth. Mm -hmm. That you can't find the truth if you manufacture consent. Yeah. Well, you can't find truth if you suppress everybody who agrees with you, yeah. disagrees with you. How do you know what truth is? Yeah. If you make a statement, if you make a statement, and I say to you, well, that statement is false. Mm -hmm. Your um, immediate reaction is going to be, really, prove me wrong. Mm -hmm. That's how you establish the truth. You make an assertion, and then if somebody else assessed or questions your assertion, mm -hmm. your reply is, prove me wrong. Mm -hmm. What if your reply would be, shut up? Would that be an honest search for truth, if your reply was shut up? Sounds like the Middle East. <laughs> so, um, I'm saying that what any two-year-old knows, yeah, yeah, yeah. that if you really, if you really uh, are committed to the truthfulness of your statement, you have to allow those who disagree with you to challenge you, and then you have the obligation, if you're committed to truth, to answer the challenge to your truth. Yeah. That's how, that's how you gradually, slowly acquire truth through the exchange of agreement, disagreement, argument, counter-argument. That's how you gradually, as I say, finally refine your argument until it's as close to truth as possible. But cancel culture denies the person the right to disagree. It's the cancel culture is, shut up, mm -hmm. instead of prove me wrong. And why is it that cancel culture is such? There's a fear, there's a weakness, there's an uncertainty in the facts or the perspectives that really rile people up into wanting to have... I think it's... Uh, it's a very much what, a humanistic element. I, I think yeah, basically what you, you're saying is true. If you're confident in your assertions, you're never afraid of naysayers. You mm -hmm. know, your attitude is... I, mean, I used to go into debates, as I frequently did in the Israel-Palestine conflict. My attitude was bring it on. Okay, let me hear your counter argument. I think I can answer it. Yeah. If you recall, when I used to speak publicly, uh, I would always say, the dissenters get to ask the first questions. 
So I would be, once I finished my presentation, mm -hmm. I would say, are there any dissenters in the room? You go first. Mm -hmm. I, I was not afraid of the dissent. Mm -hmm. Now, if you say, if you're a dissenter, leave the room, <laughs> that to me is an indication that you're not very confident in what you're saying. Mm -hmm. All right, so uh, in the book, you almost exclusively attack the political left, not the right. But since you self-describe very much as a person of the left, a uh, crusty, crochety, cantankerous, contrarian, communist, is how you formulate it in the text. Crotchety, crotchety, not crochet. <laughs> crotchety. All right, you must in some fundamental sense, and at the end of the day, consider the political right to be your deepest adversary. So why focus so much on the left at this moment in time, Mr. Finkelstein? This is a question from uh, Jonas, by the way, right? Jonas, I think. Uh -huh. Yes. Cool. Thank you, Jonas. Shout out to Jonas. <laughs> <laughs> um, because uh, I think the left has had a historic tradition. Obviously, the tradition has its weaknesses and its strengths, and one has to critically assimilate the past, mm -hmm. learn from it, but there is a general trajectory and I think that in the current times a strange thing happened. Mm -hmm. What happened was our economic system, the American economic system, is now failing for 80 percent of Americans in a way that it hasn't failed since the Great Depression in the 1930s. So there's a large, large constituency of people in general, but young people in particular, mm -hmm. who are ready for a political program based on economic fairness, mm -hmm. economic redistribution of wealth, and all of the classic themes of the left. Mm -hmm. And just at the moment when this constituency was forming, was coming into being, its most potent expression was the slogan at the time of Occupy, we are the 99%, which is to say, 99% of us are being shafted by this system. Now, I happen to think uh, it's less than 99%. It's about 80%, 85, 85%. There are 15% who are doing just fine. Mm -hmm. In New York City, you could say the 15% consists of the super rich, you know, on the Upper East Side, and then those who are involved in either IT or finance. If you're in IT or in finance, or the classic wealthy professions, namely law, medicine, and so forth, or the inherited wealth, you know, on the Upper East Side, if you uh, figure in those classes, you're doing, very, you're doing fine. That would be probably around 15%. And then the other 85%, uh, those are the real 99%. It's really about 85%. Mm -hmm. Well, what happened? Just at the point where the constituency materialized for a economic program that embraced the overwhelming majority of the American people, along came this thing called uh, identity politics, cancel culture, this cult of transgender persons, the pronouns, all of this garbage which has disoriented the left, the classic left, mm -hmm. just at the moment when there were real possibilities as evidenced by the Bernie Sanders campaign, the primary campaign, mm -hmm. that there was a real possibility for something to happen. And so I felt it was important now to, so to speak, expose this nonsense 
which is diverting and really in some ways destroying a movement that has real possibilities to affect real change that will have a real impact on real people, 85% of the people. And at this moment in time, to get obsessed by things like your pronouns strikes me as certifiable lunacy. By the way, you yourself speak to that generational divide, that problem. How many people do you live with? Currently, uh, three others. Right. A typical person in the 85%, you know, the 85%, they're living four to a place. Uh, yeah. That's what I've discovered. You know, I'm always talking to young people. You pay about 650 rent. In New York, it was, uh, it started a few years ago, it was about 800. Now it's up to 1,000. And you don't have permanent work. You don't have health insurance through your work. Mm -hmm. You don't have uh, vacation time each year. You don't have a pension. In other words, by the standards of my generation, you don't have a job. See, my generation meant if you had a job, it meant you work 40 hours a week. It meant you had sick days vacation days, it meant you had a pension, it meant you had health care. That's what a job meant. That's what a job meant. So you are part of that constituency which could easily have been won over to a relatively radical economic program as it was uh, uh, exemplified by Bernie Sanders. Medicare for all, abolish student debt, abolish college tuition, a mass public works program, and a massive redistribution of wealth. Would you have voted for that? Yeah, sure. Yes. Can you think of any person among your friends mm -hmm. who would not have supported that? Um, maybe the ultra rich. <laughs> Right, but I said among your friends. Hey, I got rich friends. Come oh, you on. do? No, I don't. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, I, I got you. Okay, okay. Yeah, it's very true. So, uh, the point of the book was to say, this is not just a nonsense, mm -hmm. but it's, uh, you know, all this identity politics and uh, anti-racism, it's not just nonsense, but it's a very destructive force just at the moment where real po when real possibilities exist. So it's more like a proxy it sounds like, you know? This is more of a... Uh, I think yeah. in part it's a proxy of the ruling class to yeah. try to divide the 85 percent to fragment them, fraction, fraction them. Um, yeah, I think in part it is a proxy uh, and it's not, a, it's not altogether surprising yeah. that a lot of these identity politics people, they get huge amounts of corporate support. They become anti-racism experts mm -hmm. for big corporations. They just roll in cash as they uh, spout cycle babble. Sheer nonsense. This is very much uh, reminiscent of the NGOs in Ramotla, for instance, yeah, as well, it's, right? Yeah, it's, it's the same tactic. Yeah. Divide it's and a, conquer, in a sense. You create, yes. you create among the oppressed, among the oppressed, mm -hmm. you pluck out a few, throw ten tons of money at them, and then they become the spokespersons and these spokespersons sound so radical. Yeah. BDS, you know, they have their slogan, BDS. We have ours, BLM, Black Lives Matter. They have their slogans, they sound so radical. There they say, one state from the river to the sea. Here they say, 
abolish the prisons, you know, prison abolitionism. They have all these radical sounding phrases, have no connection whatsoever to reality. And guess what? They get paid tons of money. It's a classic case of having your cake and eating it. You get both. You have your cake and you eat it. You get to sound radical and you get uh, deluged with money and perquisites of power. Yeah. Yes, it's like your Ramallah NGOs. How many folks among the common populace notice what is actually going on in the way that you critique it? In um, the way that you... I don't think they notice it in the way I critique it. Mm -hmm. What happens is something different. They become cynical about all po political movements, about political power, mm -hmm. about the possibility of change. They see these guys, ah, this is a race hustler. They know it. Mm -hmm. They know it. But they don't make a public display of it like I do. I, I get angry, I speak about they just drop out, which yeah, is the yeah. biggest disaster of all. Got you. you saw it during the Black Lives Matter movement because the first weeks, the first demonstrations, they were about 50% white, 50% black. Mm -hmm. By the third week, it was about 10% black. They dropped out because they realized, you know, not that they had some, they, they figured it out, some intuition told them, this is bullshit. It's not going anywhere. And they just disappeared. I agree. Okay. In your chapters on both D'Angelo and Kendi, you bring up the idea that their worldviews in some respects come close to mirroring those of the far right. Of D'Angelo, you write, D'Angelo is the flip side of the white alt-right nationalists stoking race hatred by telling white workers that they are out to take away our privileges. Sure, she says, these white privileges constitute ill-gotten gains, but the bottom line is the same. If they get their way, we lose big time. And then of Kendi, you say, uh, the assimilationist, according to Kendi, denigrates black and elevates white culture. As a preliminary point, consider how much ground Kendi has already surrendered to racists. He, in effect, concedes that a white American culture exists, hermetically sealed off from African American culture, and that this white culture can be conceptualized independently of the contributions by, by black people, or for that matter, the crimes committed against black people. Okay, so uh, as someone who's been active on the political left for decades, how do you view this flip side dynamic you describe in D'Angelo and Kennedy? You see this coming from, let's call it authentic parts of the left tradition, or is this something more recent and foreign? Look. Thank you, Jonas. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to have to figure out a way, Mr. Suleiman, yes, sir. Yes, sir. to make these questions accessible to the reader, because those are hard questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, sure. I'll put it in the uh, description of the video, the questions themselves. Yeah. Sound good? Yeah. yeah. Um, look, there are some basic facts. Racism is real, and at some level, uh, white people, in general, have been beneficiaries of this racism. It could be because black people were slaves, so the whites in the South, en masse, benefited from slave labor. It could be because our economy was built on the cheap production of cotton in the 19th century. So our economy as a whole benefited from cheap black labor. It could be because black people were kept out of the job market, so whites didn't have to compete against black people for the better jobs. So it would be silly in my mind to deny that whites in general have been beneficiaries of a system of racism that I have no problem with. What I do have a problem with is the argument that 
whites in general have been equal beneficiaries of racism, namely me and Jeff Bezos have equally benefited from this system. Uh, I don't accept that. And I also don't accept that there is a broad, I don't accept that there is, let's put it positively, in my view, there is a broad common interest between most whites, that 85%, and most blacks against those who are beneficiaries of the system, that we have a lot more in common, especially at this moment in time, between <clears throat> the white, um, the white, uh, the white non-beneficiaries of this system, and the black non-beneficiaries of this system. We have a lot in common. Again, you saw that George during the George Floyd demonstrations. It was clear, at least to me, that there was a real solidarity, not just against racism that was manifest in those demonstrations, there was a solidarity of common interest, namely that this system is shafting all of us. Now, is it worse for black people? Yes. But are we all being shafted by the system? That's yes also. What people like D'Angelo and Kendi do is they set at odds, they create friction and conflict among the 85% of whites and blacks who have an overarching common interest. The message uh, Robin D'Angelo says is, except for me, meaning her, this airhead, this white Whoopi Goldberg, except for her, you can't trust white people. That's what she's telling blacks. Don't trust them. They, they think you're all apes and gorillas. I mean that, that's what she says. They think you're all apes and gorillas. They're all benefiting from the system. Uh, Jeff Bezos, Norman Finkelstein, there's no difference between them. They're both white exploiters of black people. So her message is, don't unite. Don't work together. Don't trust them. She's just an agent of the ruling elites. That's why they like her, because she divides. That's why she has such a big platform as well, it sounds like, too. Yeah. Um, is there any way to counter this sort of thing, other than actual doing the opposite of what they suggest? Well, you know, it's actually a problem now, yeah. because all these corporations are hiring these diversity, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion counselors. These really crazy people, sheer lunatics. Mm -hmm. And then you have to attend their seminars and attend their meetings, mm -hmm. and you have to learn how to get along. It's like a, it's like a freak show. Mm -hmm. I need... Do black people need Robin D'Angelo? What, they're so shy? They're all such, uh, 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 what's the word, shrinking violets? If a black person has a complaint, let him or her register the complaint. Mm -hmm. Or let them collectively let register the complaint. What, what do they need Robin D'Angelo for? This flaky, wookie, wookie uh, Goldberg in dreads. What do they need her for? So, uh, it is becoming a menace, these people, with their lecturing on racism, and she talks about, she, she gives feedback 
in order to build up your race stamina. I mean, these are freaks. She's like a personal trainer in race in racism. Mm -hmm. Um. Frankly, uh, I mean, you have two choices: to just go to these freaky meetings and then just forget about it, or just to call it or to call it out and say, "I'm not going." That's not how you fight racism. You know how you fight racism, I'll tell you. The first way to fight racism is uh, uh, establish a living wage. That's a good way to start fight racism. Establish a, a living wage so we can live with dignity, and that way we'll gain some respect. Mm -hmm. So I would say to Amazon, to all these corporations, Google, who are now hiring race, equity, and inclusion experts, I would say save the money on your experts and just give us a salary wage, a, a wage increase. We don't need that. We need dignity. And personal dignity is not possible on the current minimum wage. So. You take your equity, diversity, equity, and inclusion experts, shove it, and you just give us a salary increase. How you characterize Biden's administration and the cabinet? It is one of the most diverse. However, is it not? I don't. The irony of it? I, I don't. I don't personally, at this point in time, mm -hmm. see any special merit in the fact that a cabinet is diverse in your terms, which by that you mean by the standard of identity politics. Mm -hmm. Do I think it marks a huge, even a, a not huge, forget about a huge, even a modest gain that Kamala Harris is our vice president, a black woman. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe she's a lesbian too, so, and let's say maybe she's transitioning to being a man, who knows. So let's say she were not just a black woman, but a black woman, lesbian, transitioning uh, to a man. Would that mark, in my opinion, a huge advance in our, uh, in our uh, political life or social life? My answer is no. I don't see it. I don't see it. Uh, we have to, barriers have been broken. There are lots of members now in the ruling elite who are black. There are lots of members who are women. That hurdle has been overcome. And now it's time to focus on the substance. Mm -hmm. What are they saying? What are they offering? At this point in time, the uh, most likely candidate, the Democratic side, so far, you know, obviously it's very early, is Pete Buttigieg, Buttigieg, and he's just trying to pull an Obama, you know, the first gay uh, man uh, as president. Do you believe that's going to make a big change in our country if he's elected? Um, I think, yeah, I think that would be, I don't know, I don't know his politics. Don't you think you should know his politics? <laughs> Just the, uh, the idea, though, is uh, yeah, a huge shift, I would say. What Definitely. shift? Well, the homosexuality so aspect. So what? Well, that if, he, if, he, if he's still a tool of the ruling class... <laughs> oh, got you. Yeah, you know what? Many people would actually say the homosexual agenda and whatnot is the tool of shaitan, etc. Say, all right, we're getting, shaitan? Yeah, shaitan, Satan, you know, Satan, etc., etc. Where did you come up with shaitan? Shaitan, that's like the uh, Arabic word for, uh, you know. Oh, for Satan? Oh, I'm just not aware of yeah, that. All right, anyways, uh, most of your chapter on Obama deals with U.S. domestic you, politics. You if we look specifically. <laughs> I, I mean, what do you. Go ahead, you got no, I'm asking, do, do you. Let's say the new Secretary of Defense were the son of King Abdullah in Jordan. Oh, his son became an American citizen and then he was named Secretary of Defense. Do you think that would make a, a represent a big advance? Oh uh, yeah, I think like uh, Why is that an advance? Just people's perception. Well, 
Behind the scenes, sure, no, it's same old facade, just a different color, different tone, different background, nationality. Yeah, sure. I think uh, sentimentally, though, inspirationally, for people who don't maybe see that deeply, you know, kind of gives a morale boost in a certain sense, the way Obama did for others. And I mean, that's something to account for. It's not very... It is real intangible, I would say, on the micro level, but not on the substantive level of actual... I mean, it could be that, too. You know, once on the micro level, things can also branch off and create certain nuances and changes. Insofar as people don't actually sober up and identify exactly what's going on and who people really are and what their intentions are, though, then, yeah, like you say, radical change requires a radical action in that sense. And so, yeah, you know, it'll still be a, a civil war of sorts to make Do you care? Like, let's hit an Arab like the president, an Arab American. Like the, <laughs> do you care? Yeah, I mean, who, who else would be that Arab American president but yours truly? So, of course, I would care. <laughs> Come on, man. All right, anyways. I got your point. Uh, what else? Anything else you want to say? No, but would you care? <laughs> It'd be interesting, but why to me it would be the same. Why is it interesting? There are there are there are fifteen Arab heads of state right now in the Middle East. They're all crooks. Yeah. So now you think it's going to be better if we have one more crook in the United States? Who votes? Right, voting here in the U.S. is much different than in the Middle East. Yeah, you know, different government types, etc. So the thought that an Arab American would become president in and of itself after we had Trump in office as of recent, right? I mean, that accounts for some sort of gasp of, oh, what the hell is going on? <laughs> you know, what do you think? You don't think so? No. So what does that say then? What do you, what do you say no. exactly? You're okay, saying that the voting process itself is I'm corruptible saying, in I'm a saying sense, that or? It's a, good, it's a good thing for our country that among young people, your age cohort, the polls showed in 2020 that across the board, across the board, every ethnic group, every racial group, every religious group, uh, every... Um, uh, uh, sex, sex orientation, Bernie Sanders got about 80% of the support uh, during the Democratic primary among that age cohort, your age cohort. He's white, he's male, he's old as the hills, he's completely unhip, and it's a credit to your generation that even though they've been deluged with all of this identity politics crap, they didn't fall for it. They listened to what the candidates said, what they promised, what was their track record. They looked at those things, and guess what? They went for the septuagenarian Jewish white male from Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, is what ought to be happening. They're looking at the substance. So when I hear you say you care about the diversity of the Biden administration, it tells me that you're out of tune. I didn't say I care. I just included that in the posing of the question itself as an interesting you know, thought. That's it. I wanted to get your opinion on, mm -hmm. despite what you said, oh, diversity, what do you make of that? But continue. So, yes, sir. Go, go. Yes, no, I've, I've said what I have to say, that okay. I just don't think that's a... Uh, there was a time when you wanted to see minorities uh, to break the barriers, to get in. But that's already happened. It's passe. It's mm -hmm. happened. We've had a black president. We now have a black vice president. Uh, we've had women in all positions of power except for president. Uh, we've had... Uh, every imaginable permutation and combination across the board in power. So that's over. That's been there, done that. And now let's focus on the substance. 
Without Obama having been president, do you think Bernie Sanders would have caught this much momentum among the people who, very similarly, were the ones who had voted and were riled up in enthusiasm for Obama when Obama hit the scene? In a sense, Obama kind of helped Bernie Sanders propel himself to, you know, such... Uh, there, is an, uh, there is an argument there. Yeah. The argument I would say is this that the Obama campaign and then the Obama presidency mm -hmm. was very educative to the American people. It told them that identity politics isn't going to get you anything, but you have to vote for substance. Mm -hmm. So after the Obama uh, presidency, people start to look for something else. They no longer were looking for a hip black guy. Gosh, you saw it helped inversely, the inverse. Yeah, it, it, it demonstrated the Obama phenomenon, mm -hmm. demonstrated the utter bankruptcy and hollowness mm -hmm. of identity politics. And then the next person to grip the imagination of the um, of the young people in particular was a very unhip old white man and i think to some extent the fact that obama by his person exploded exploded all the hopes and expectations of di identity politics mm -hmm. then it opened up the way for bernie uh, I think Pete Buttigieg doesn't have a, a snowball's chance in hell. If you think you're going to pull off another Obama, this time uh, it's going to be your sexual orientation and not your race, you're barking up the wrong tree. People don't care about that anymore. Mm -hmm. They want to hear the substance. And that was a good result of Obama, that he dispelled all the myths of identity politics. Yeah. Okay. Alright, um, a reappearing theme in the book is that of the cult. As you describe it, Kendi is the guru, the guru of a cult. Obama is surrounded by a cult of personality <laughs> and the BDS movement protesting Israel you also see as a cult. Mm -hmm. Elsewhere, you've spoken about your own past history as a member of the Maoist cult. What kind of differences and similarities do you see between the Maoist cult you yourself were a part of and the various cult-like behavior you discuss in the book? Do you, think you pers do you think your personal background made you aware of aspects here that others might miss? Well, that's a complicated question. Uh, sure. It's a good question. Yeah. It's a good question, but it's a complicated one. Okay. Uh, what is a cult? You know, people always say, why do you call BDS a cult? Why do you call that a cult? There are certain characteristics of a cult. The first one, you know, is blind obey obeisance, blind obedience mm -hmm. to the great leader. Mm -hmm. you know, the cults always have the great leader, and you blindly obey the cult of the great leader. Then there are, then there's the insularity of a cult. It's very closed off and it has its slogans, it has its um, terminology, uh, and it doesn't have any content. There's no intellectual content there. There's no real research, no real study, no real analysis. It's all built on sloganeering, radical posturing, posing, and preening. Mm -hmm. This holier-than-thou attitude, like we're better, we're superior. The whole uh, Obama, he became, in my generation, if you wanted to show you were hip, you were cool, mm -hmm. you always, you love jazz. You went to jazz clubs, that showed you know, you were really here. And Obama became the substitute, the surrogate for jazz in your generation. 
you loved Obama. It was all just this kind of theater in order to show how superior you were. Mm -hmm. So when you, when you see cult, and of course the other part of a cult of which I've been several times a victim is it, it casts out any dissenters. If you dare say, well, I'm not sure if uh, the great leader is quite as uh, great as you claim he is, then you're immediately uh, exiled uh, from the cult. The difference, in my opinion, is between my cult and the current cults mm -hmm. is the following. We were Maoists, okay? We wanted to change the world. We had a very concrete idea. I'm not saying our tactics and strategy. We had a very concrete idea of what we want to change. So among the things we wanted to change was we want working people to have power. We wanted a fair distribution of wealth. We wanted human re relations between people to be more humane. We wanted to lift the wretched of the earth, the poor, the sufferers. We wanted to lift all of them. We were on the side of, <clears throat> as Franz Fanon put it, we were on the side of the wretched of the earth. Uh, so I would say that even though our tactics, our strategy, our approach is kind of crazy, mm -hmm. totally divorced from the reality of our country, our system, our history, and so forth, I would say our goals, our objectives, they were noble, they were decent. We were animated by, on the whole, we were animated by very positive, uh, aspirations. Uh, the current identity politics uh, is making a world more congenial to pronouns, a meaningful goal or objective mm -hmm. is uh, making a cult out of trans people using them and exploiting them to show how beautiful you are? Is that a substantive, meaningful objective or goal? I find the goals, the objectives, they're so self-absorbed. It's all about showing the world how beautiful you are. I didn't, we didn't do that back then. You know what I used to do? I worked, uh, I worked for a newspaper called The Guardian. It was a Maoist newspaper, okay? You know how much we made a week? I mean, you won't believe it. This was the 1970s. I made $55 a week. You hear me? $55 a week. Believe me, even back then, that wasn't... That wasn't near a non-living wage. Forget about near a living wage. That wasn't even near a non-living Do you know what we were expected to do in our off hours when we weren't working? We were expected to go on picket lines. I worked um, on, I walked the picket lines for the United Farm Workers. That was a, 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 a Chicano people who were organizing to get a union, the United Farm Workers, UFW. So on Friday nights, I would go to a liquor store. Uh, uh, it was called Flatbush Liquors. And the liquor stores carried Gallo wine. And Gallo wine was, uh, it was um, from the vineyards where the farm workers worked, okay? So we were organizing boycotts of the liquor stores where they were sold, mm -hmm. all right? So Friday nights, when you're going out carousing, mm -hmm. drinking, clubbing, smoking, <laughs> I would go to Flatbush Liquors on a picket line with fellow Maoists, mm -hmm. and we would chant things like, Flat, uh, uh, Flatbush Liquors, Flatbush Liquors, we say no, Scab Gallows got to go. 
scab means they brought in non-union workers uh, to pick the um, grapes for the wine. Okay? So a scab, you know what a scab is? A scab is the term that union people may use for non-union workers who are brought in to do the work because the union is on strike. So a scab worker, you, you get that, right? Somebody who crosses the picket line. And, mm -hmm. So flatbush liquors, we say no, scab gallows, gotta go. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, we were helping the farm workers union, in this case the UFW, and it was a, I have no reservations now about saying that was a good thing to do. Mm -hmm. We were trying to enable uh, Mexican-American workers, Chicano workers, to organize a union. Nowadays, what's considered radical? Posting your pronouns online. That, that's considered radical, posting your pronouns online. So, I refuse, I will admit, mine was a cult. We had our great leader, Chairman Mao. We had our local leaders here. We called everyone who disagreed with us, we called them a bourgeois or a petty bourgeois. We cast out anybody who was uh, disagreed with us. I'll admit to all of that. I have no problem with saying it. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that uh, the, uh, the objectives were the same. We really were concerned about the real world. Uh, right now, it's just pure narcissism. It's navel-gazing. Mm -hmm. It's not politics. It's navel-gazing. I, I can't tell you how it just fills me with disgust to see what's happening you know. Where does this lead to? All of this that you're describing? Naval gazing, etc. Mm -hmm. When will the people realize that, you know, this was very much upsub well, insubstantial? Good, you know, insubstantial. It's a good question. I, I don't know. I, I, I feel like right now you could see that the, there's a real reaction has set in to the cancel culture. People are starting to mock it. People are getting sick of it. Um, you know, you, you take the case of um, my, my classes. Uh, I started teaching again about three years ago. Modestly, I don't have a position, but every semester I get hired here or there. I teach at a city university of New York, which is mostly immigrant kids, working class kids, um, uh, of every possible race, religion, ethnic orientation. That's and, good, so, yeah. That's, yeah. That's so they're, they're pretty representative of the 85%. Mm -hmm. They're very tolerant, mm -hmm. they're very mutually supportive, mm -hmm. but I'll tell you, in three years, in three years, I've only had one student, one, who emailed me his pronouns. Mm -hmm. That was it. There's no interest in it. It's like, it's a very elite phenomenon. Mm -hmm. It's not, the broad mass of people have no interest whatsoever in this stuff. So, um, I think it, it contaminates a thin tier who unfortunately have a lot of money, a lot of power, like the Ramallah NGOs, mm -hmm. but among people in, you know, young people in general, you know, you can correct me, look, you're not here to just ask me questions, I'm talking about your generation. So you live with three roommates, would you say the roommates are fairly representative of young people? Oh, yeah. Okay, so their income is more or less what young people are making nowadays, they're at the same stage in life as most young people. Uh, would you say they're concerned about pronouns? Uh, to be honest, I don't know them well enough, uh -huh. but, okay. yeah, I'm not sure. I don't imagine so. If it doesn't affect one's daily life and daily aspirations towards where they want to go, per se, unless they do themselves identify as, you But know, even if certain... they identify as this or that, yeah. it's just a fact, you know. I like, I happen to like guys, mm -hmm. uh, this or that, but it's not like an obsession. Yeah. It's just a fact. People are very tolerant of each other, young people nowadays, you know, remarkably so if you compare it with my generation. 
uh, but it's not uh, all encompassing. It's like yeah, it's not used I as still a need a job. Yeah. I still would like to get my own place. Yeah. I still would like to. Ha I still am struggling with health care. I'm still paying my student loans. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think it's a very narrow tier of people who are obsessing over these things. Yeah. So when you ask me when is it going to pass, for about 90% of young people, it was never there in the first place. Mm -hmm. It didn't affect them. And you know where it affects people? In the elite universities. In the elite universities, they begin seminar class. Each person, you go around the room, tells the class what are his or her pronouns. You know? Yeah. yeah. But you know, that doesn't happen where I teach. Yeah. 